Good evening and welcome once again to uh, Good News Wednesday Night Bible Study where we are studying the Word of God and dealing with the doctrines um, of the Word of God and the doctrines to our faith. We pray that um, God is um, strengthening you through this and that you are learning the, the, the truths of God's Word as we try to develop this as a sense of discipleship. And I know uh, maybe some that don't know the Lord that are following this, I hope that these uh, truths will help you to uh, want to know more about the Word of God. Um, <clears throat> once again, we wanted to thank you and praise you for this opportunity to let us uh, change our time. We're now at 6.30 to 7.15. So we like to always start with a time of prayer. So we want to... Um, uh, always look to those that we know during this time that those that have bereavement that we're dealing with we have those that are dealing with the sickness those who are losing jobs those who are uh, just need God's guidance in everyday life and he tells us that we are to be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication that we are to let our requests be made known to him and the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus so we're going to ask you time. As we go to the next screen there, I uh, remind you of the things that we always pray about, and we want to uh, make it a matter of prayer to pray uh, about everything. Don't worry about nothing. Jesus says that, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things that you need will be added unto you. So in other words, our priority of life is ought to be him first. So let us look to the Lord as we, we pray. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come tonight, Father, with our heads bowed, but our hearts are looking unto you to thank you, to praise you, Father, for another day, Father. Thank you, Father, how you have kept us from all harm and danger, Father. We thank you for your Son and your Holy Spirit, Father, O oh God, that have given us the right to come boldly to your throne of grace. And, Lord, we want to intercede for those who can't pray for themselves, those, O oh Lord, who are dealing with bereavement tonight, who have lost a loved one, Father. We pray, O oh God, that you would comfort them, Father, realizing, O oh God, that all this that you do, you do well. And, Lord, we pray for those that are dealing with sickness, O oh God, that they will come to realize, O oh Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Those that are needing provisions, Father, for their daily food, light bills, money, and, Lord, uh, just to every day realize that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. So, Lord, we ask, O oh God, now that you would be with us and keep us, O oh God, as we get into your words. Search my heart and search my mind, Father, that anything I say tonight be used for your glory and for your honor. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Praise the Lord. And once we get, we know we're talking about the subject of tonight is holiness, uh, not legalism. And just kind of refresh you what we're talking about. Holiness is the holiness of what Christ has done for us. Remember when you were saved, Christ declared you holy and he set you apart. Legalism is that where now that you're trying to live, keeping a set of rules. You know, it's like, when you join the church and they give you, say, what well, you don't do this, you don't do that. Those things there are the keeping the law. And that's when Jesus says, I didn't come to uh, condemn the law, but fulfill the law. That and then he tells you and I as believers that accept our righteousness, exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. We are in no wise in the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? See, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very legalistic. They kept the external law. They did things in front of the people to make them seem they were holy, but their hearts were not right. The difference in what holiness, we're trusting what Christ has done and not us. And that's what we're talking about now and so far. And then we come to the point where we are the next there where we are breaking it down to the point where practical holiness. Now, let me explain to the practical holiness that we've been talking about. This is our everyday life. If you are saved and you are uh, living by faith and under the lordship of Jesus Christ, you ought to be living a life as much as possible free from living in sin. Now, remember this, and I said this on last week, I'm not teaching uh, sinless perfection because the Bible tells us that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he tells us also in John, he says that he that said he sinneth not is a liar and the truth is not in you. So that's what practical holiness is about, saying, yes, yeah, yes, we are saved from sin, but yes, and we're saved by the grace of God. So what I'm teaching is that here, yes, we sin, but we ought to be sinning less because we're pursuing a life of holiness to live like Jesus Christ and not in our own power, but the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and I was trying to make this in a practical section. And then what I use, I said on last week, I'm using J. C. Rowell's uh, his outline of talking about. He bought, wrote, a, wrote a book on holiness, and he used a, uh, the scripture to kind of backbone of this and show you how important it is for holiness in our life. And it's taken from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 14, which in that, uh, this chapter 12, remember it starts off in that very first verse without turning there. He tells us that we have so great a cloud of witness, we lay aside those sins which do so easily beset us and run with patience. The race is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. What is he saying? That since we have those in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the Hall of Fame of Faith who died looking in here, you and I have something to look forward to. So our desire is to what? Follow peace. And that word follow is another word to pursue peace with all men. As people of God, we ought to be peacemakers. Even Jesus says that, blessed are the peacemakers for they would shall see God. That's what we are. As Christians, we ought to be peacemakers and we ought to be living at peace with all men. Scripture that I haven't talked about much over there and it's all in the Romans without turning there. He tells us that uh, that we ought to live at peace with all men if it be possible. There are some people it's impossible. It's hard to live at peace with, but as much as possible, it says uh, you know, the burden is not on the person that is getting on our nerve. The burden is on us as believers to follow peace with all men. And there, here's the point here in that B part of that verse is where he drives the point. Just as we are to pursue peace with all men, we are to pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Now, let me pause and say that. What he's saying here, pursue holiness, the righteousness of life, a life that is pleasing to God, a life that is living free from the bondage of sin is what he's telling us to do. And that's where we are at that point. So, now, we're going to be getting a little help tonight from an assistant Whitehurst is going to be kind of, uh, you know, from type of points. I would say that if there's any questions or anything that maybe come to her mind that, you know, she may want to bring, or maybe ask a question that she thinks somebody else may want to ask and uh, get an answer for. Her. But at this point, I think, I think she had something she wanted to uh, question about this one verse here. And uh, I give her the opportunity to say that. Just can you go into a little bit more detail where it says, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Are you saying that if um, uh, you're not holy, you cannot see the Lord? Okay, what, it, what it's saying here is actually, remember we're going to talk, this is about sanctification. It's another way of saying without sanctification, you won't see the Lord. In other words, if a person is not living a sanctified life, a, set, a life apart from sin, then yes, they will not see the Lord. And I would like to even take it uh, even a little further there in the evangelistic way. If we as the body of Christ is not living a life of holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, an unbeliever, an unbeliever will not uh, have a, a, a good view of Christ in us. So it's twofold there. But I believe the text is saying that we ought to be pursuing a holiness, a life of sanctification, a life that is set apart for without no man see the Lord. In other words, without sanctification, in other words, there is no seeing the Lord. In other words, there is no salvation from that. It's not saying that you don't sin, but it's saying that you are pursuing a life of sanctification, living the set apart, and I will deal with the whole meaning of that when we get into the uh, study tonight. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it would help you. Is that here? And remember, um, J.C. Rowles gave a breakdown, and this is what I taught last week of each one of these points here. And He said, a person that is pursuing Holiness, in other words, here's some things that should be in your life, and you ought, and this is kind of he used it as a capstone to you ought to uh, judge yourself. Matter of fact, it tells us in First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, which we hear all the time in um, First Sunday when we tell in communion or in your church, you do it. He said, Let a man what examine. examine himself. Well, this is the kind of things that you can examine yourself and see if you say you are saved, sanctified, filled with the Spirit of God, and you're walking in a holiness life, there are some things that should be in your life that comes to Christ. And one thing J.C. Rowell brings up, he said, holiness is a habit of agreeing with God, with, with the mind of God, which means that holiness, you, you, you agree with the word of God is complete, inerrant, in other words, and holy, the word of God leads us to the mind of Christ. And if we're going to live a holy life, you can't do it apart from the word of God. Secondly, he talks about... <clears throat> A holy person would endeavor 
to turn away from every known sin. And now this is very important. Listen to what I'm saying here. A holy person, that means a person that is saved. I'm not talking to the unsaved, but to remember in the, uh, this Hebrew church, there were uh, those that were saved. There are those what we call Judaizers, those who were drifting back into the law. And then there were some unsaved people who were there, and they were, uh, he was letting them know that they, they needed to repent and come to see Christ. So there are three groups of people he's talking in Hebrews. But here, I believe he's dressed with a person who is determined, if you are saved, is this your desire? Let me say it again. A holy person will endeavor to turn away from every known sin. And I think that she has a question on this part. So if one doesn't turn away from a known sin, are they not holy? They're not holy. Well, uh, let's, let's say it this way. They're not saying that they're not holy. But if a person that is a holy person will interpret for him, because the Bible said, tells us that uh, we are to confess our sins and to repent of our sins. That's what I think. So if a, if a person is holy and they have Christ in us, mm -hmm. we cannot continue to live in sin. The Bible uh -huh. tells us in the book of Romans, it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God, God forbid. forbid. So if a person is holy and they have Christ in us, they will turn from them. And sometimes, you know, you may fall into a sinful state. The Holy Spirit will convict you. When he convicts you, then what you do, you confess and repent. And this is what the problem I live with a lot of people. They know they're sinning, but they don't want to change. Now, in the context of saying if it's a saved person and a saved person uh, don't turn from their sin, they're out of fellowship with God. And if you don't, uh, if, you're, if you're saved and you don't endeavor to turn from that sin, you don't repent of that sin, it says here, those he loved, he what? Chasten. Which means that... Uh, if, you, if you're a believer and you are a holy person, you've been sanctified by Jesus Christ, set apart from him, and you're innocent and you don't change, you will be punished. God will punish you to bring you to a point. Then he, he actually even puts it to a point that so that if a person, if you don't change in that punishment, he says you are a bastard, which means you're an illegitimate child. You're really not saved. If, you, if you're a living sin, God's not judging you, you're not punished for it, and you're just living in it and enjoying it. He says you're illegitimate. In other words, you're not saved. That's basically what he's saying in there. So, but those he loved, yes. How do they endeavor to turn from sin? We confess it, repent of it, and he says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I think I need the point to say this too, is that when we sin, it ought to burden our hearts because what Christ has done for in, in the book of Hebrews, he didn't tell them, he said, we, we, we make the, the cross of Christ a foot. We make it uh, unholy or unrighteous. I think. We're, we're, we're trampling it underfoot. It's making it not sanctified or sacred to Christ. So if you're a holy person, yeah, you should want to turn from every known sin. Okay? All right. So I, I don't know if I help you with that. Or that the same. Do you have another question to uh, help you with that point? Okay, second day, now the only thing he tells us here, J.C. Rowles, when he was said, a holy person will strive to be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That should be your desire. Every morning you wake up. Paul says in the book of Philippians that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering and the, that I know him and the, fellow, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. In other words, he's striving to be like Christ. And then he says, not if I've obtained, but he could what? He pressed toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Christ in Christ Jesus. It ought to be our desire and our pursuit in life to be more like Jesus Christ. And, and we know that, uh, especially as believers, the scripture we all like to quote, Romans 8 and 28, and it tells us here, so all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Why? That he wants to be conformed to the image of his son. So you realize that the things that you're going through, Christ is, God is trying to make you more like Jesus Christ. But if you're just uh, saying you're a Christian and you're not striving to be Christ-like, chances are you need to really trust your relationship with Jesus Christ. A holy person will strive or pursue to be more like Jesus Christ, not just on Sunday, but in their everyday life. Amen. Next one. And this is the point here that he says here, a holy person will pursue meekness, Endurance, gentleness, patience, kindness, control of their tongue. 
Um, and this is right here is what he's saying. Uh, because these are, if you notice, are all fruits of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. A person, a holy person, have the Holy Spirit in them. And with the Holy Spirit in them, they're striving to live, bear fruit that comes out of the Holy Spirit, not in their own power. And uh, that's what a person, a person holy, if you're not pursuing this, then chances are you may need to check your relationship. Uh, another thing, there, a holy person will pursue love and brotherly kindness. In other words, Jesus says, by this you all men and know your many disciples, that you what? Have love one for another. In Christ, what we're pursuing? To be love one another and brotherly kindness. And he says, we'll love our others as Christ has loved us. Finally, a holy person will pr pursue purity of heart. And I think she has a question on this, and uh, let's see if I can help you with that. Why is it so hard for people to have these characteristics in their life? Meekness, endurance, patience, kindness, controlling of, of the tongue, um, and purity of heart. Purity of heart. Why is it important for them to have that? Why is it so hard oh, for people so hard. to have these characteristics? Well, because they're trying to live the Christian life in their own power, in, in the flesh. Um, and because, remember when he says that we are to yield our body over to Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. She said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be hard to have a purity of heart because we're, we're, we're born in the sin, shaping in iniquity, David said. We're going to do what comes natural. But when you uh, empty yourself uh, of the flesh and be filled with the Holy Spirit, then it wouldn't be as hard. Now, I'm not saying you're going to do these every time, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and a purity of heart. In other words, that's the pursuit because that's not coming of you. It's going to come through the power of the Holy Spirit. So why is hard as people trying to do it? They're trying to do it in their own power. And he tells us those in the flesh cannot please God. Which leads me into the point that I want to even talk about tonight in this subject here is uh, how this happens. What would make it easier for those who say they're in Christ or they're holy, how to live this life that we're talking about of holiness? Well, you need to understand uh, what sanctification is and what I'm talking about tonight, which can lead that practical holiness. Another way for saying that in theological sense is progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification. Now, what is progressive sanctification? Uh, first of all, sanctification is the process of the Holy Spirit uh, work producing Christ likeness in us. So that's what he's saying. Why is it pursue holiness? It's because sanctification is the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to produce Christ likeness in us. And let me say this on the onset the life of holiness is not done in the flesh. You can't live a holy life in the flesh. He said, those in the flesh cannot please God, nor his work can they do. Why? Because we're in the flesh. The flesh is going to do what going to, and the flesh and the spirit, there's a fight going between one another. If you notice, if you're not spending time in the word of God, worshiping the Lord, spending time with him, you're fine. But you're spending all your time feeding the flesh, eating and uh, doing the pleasures of life. I guarantee you, you find it easier to do things of the flesh than to do things of the spirit. So that's what uh, progressive sanctification is about. And let me talk a little bit more about this uh, progressive sanctification. On, and so I'm not going to give you what you call a full theological explanation for this doctrine of sanctification, but I will attempt to help you uh, come to a better understanding of knowing the importance of you living a holy life. And that's what it is here. Uh, first, I want to say this here because uh, to set out the doctrine of holiness is not optional for the believers. Let me say that again. It's not optional, and holiness is not an organization. Holiness is not uh, a list of rules. Holiness is what Christ does in us. Amen. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why, in that verse that we had here, in Hebrews 12 and 14, again, which uh, we said here, and look what it says here, um, which is now, I think we got it, I I think we got to go back. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. I already talked about that one. And here's one something I wanted to say that um, as before we get to that scripture. And it says in here, Charles Hodges makes the statement that I really think hits this on the nail about the progressive sanctification. And he says here, to be in Christ is the source of the Christian life. 
To be like Christ is the sum of his excellency. Excellent. To be with Christ is the fullness of his joy. joy. Now think about this. This is progressive sanctification. I think that it's spelled out. First, to be in Christ is the source of the Christian life. In other words, to be in Christ is to be saved. A person that's saved is a holy life. Once you accept Jesus Christ, you are holy. Then it says, to be like Christ is the sanctification process. He is sanctifying us that we are being his excellency. And to be, in, it says, to be with Christ is the fullness of joy. And you won't totally be uh, sanctified, uh, perfectly sanctified until we are in the presence of Christ. So I, I like that. Let me read it again. To be in Christ is the source of the Christian's life. To be like Christ is the sum of his excellency, the work of the Holy Spirit. To be with Christ is the fullness of his joy. Charles Hodges. Mm -hmm. Love it. Good statement in here. So, in that sanctification process, it brings me back to the point where we sit here. The ESB says it like this. He said, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without, no, without which no one will see the Lord. Now, I like the King James, which I learned this verse. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without to know to see the Lord. What is he saying? That word, another word for strive is to pursue. Our life is to pursue peace with everyone and what? Holiness. Sanctification. Without no one seeing the Lord. So and without sanctification, you're not going to see Christ. Amen. At, at this point blank is what he's saying to us here. So before I get into this whole process, let me give you the definition of this whole word of of uh, progress, uh, progressive sanctification. First, the word progressive means, uh, progressive, which means to, to gradually advance to the extent. It means to be characterized by a process. In other words, what he's saying, that we're, if we're going to uh, progressive sanctification, that means that we are what? We're gradually advancing and moving forward to that extent. And it's moving forward and onward. It's a change that occurs gradually over a period of time. Let me say this here, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, that sanctification is not something all of a sudden, you, you, a sanctification, I get saved, and now I'm totally sanctified. No, sanctified, set apart for Christ's use, that is positionally, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, but the taking away from sin is a process that God is working on our life. Another word, so that's what progressivism means to move forward. Another word that uh, we talked about in this is sanctification. And sanctification is that, and then here is just a working definition that I found here, the act or process of acquiring sanctity, of being made or becoming holy. That word holy means set apart. Also, it is an act or process of being set apart as are declared holy and consecrated. That's what we mean. So what we're saying, progressive sanctification, that we're gradually moving in the process of being sanctified, set apart for God's use. Lastly, it said, the state of growing in divine grace as a result of a Christian commitment after conversion. So that's what sanctification is. So when he's saying here, we said strive for peace with everyone and without holiness we're seeing the Lord. He's saying, let the sanctification process work out in your life. Sanctification is a process of God's grace by which the believer is separated from sin and become dedicated to God's righteousness. And I can't say this as much more because when I was writing this and done this here, I had to go back to some papers that I had written years ago when I was in school. And I had to understand this. I remember I said, I come up in a holiness church, but I went to a basically Baptist uh, school, a kind of a, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was, it was Baptist or an evangelical school. So, I had to struggle with this whole thing with sanctification because I, you know, I would thought, you know, hey, I, I was called the, the bone scraper because I, you name it, I dealt with the sin. And God had to deal with me that to learn that people sometimes are sitting there struggling because they have not really been taught what the God has given them to get victory over their sinful habits. So let me say that again. Sanctification is the process of God's grace by which the believer is separated from sin and becoming dedicated to God's righteousness. And how is it accomplished? Through the word of God and through the work of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be sanctified apart from the word of God and apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I said there, people who are not getting the word, meditating on the word, spending time in God's word, worshiping in God's word, learning God's word, and applying it to their life, 
then you're going to have a hard time living a holy life. Why? Because the only way you're going to know what God wants you to do is get in his word. And the only way you're going to do what his word says, you realize, remember I said, when she said, why people have heart? You can't do it in the flesh. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you can accomplish this. So, now how do we do that? Look what Jesus said in John 17, 7, to show you here how it is the work of God. It says here, now they know that everything that... Now, they know that everything that you have given me is from you. This is what? It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working together in this sanctification process. So what Jesus is saying here is that now, everything that you, I, Father has given him, he's given to us, that we are here, right? And it's done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the Spirit's help, right? First, got to have the word from the Father. We get it through Jesus Christ, right? Now look what the Holy Spirit says in Romans 8, 3, and 4. It says here, For God has done, for what the God has done, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not at the, according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let me say this, what, it, what it's kind of about. Let's go back to the verse and kind of walk through here. So it said, for God hath done what the law could not do in the flesh. In other words, the law showed us there's nothing wrong with the law. He tells us earlier he's in uh, Romans, the seventh chapter, the law is good and perfect. The problem is us. We can't keep the law. So, so we couldn't keep the law, and God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law in, uh, in, uh, in fulfill the law that you and I now will be condemned by the law. You see what I'm saying here? That's why he said, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. In us. How do you do it? In Christ. When you're in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, the life that we live, we live through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not before you, but Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet the, I live. Not I, but... Christ liveth in me, and the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. So, if you and I, we can't be sanctified keeping the law. The law showed us how sinful we are. I don't know about you, you have tried to do things keeping the law. The Bible said if you keep the law, you break one, you're guilty of all. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away, but fulfill. And, man, I, can I pause? I brought my own amen. I brought my own hallelujah with that. Thank God. For Christ coming and fulfilling the law of us. Because I could not do it in my own power. He did it for us through Jesus Christ. So, what am I saying? Sanctification results in holiness. And purification from the guilt and the power of sin through what? Jesus Christ. Now, I said it on Sunday when I was preaching. And I get excited when I think about that. And it says that there is now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, and that's the stops right there. It, the it's just writers and scholars that said that was added who walked not after the flesh but after the spirit was added in context. But I think what they're trying to do is take what verse 4 was saying and put it up there. So, in other words, how there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you're saved. Christ has fulfilled the law in you. You and I are holy. And brothers and sisters, let me say, it's not trusting what you do, but what Christ has done in you. And once you realize what Christ has done in you, you have the Spirit, you can fulfill the law in Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, and this is important to understand because it lets us know that holiness could never be accomplished in our own power. You can't be holy in your own power. That's the reason why some people, you know, you see them, they get saved, and they come to the church, and they say they confess their sins, and they know their life, and they go out and they fall into sin. They think they lost their salvation and they need to get saved all over again. You see them at the altar for that same sin over and over and over again. And realize what they need to realize. Christ has fulfilled that. You don't have to continue to live in sin. Amen? Amen. He said, we have been, sin has been, uh, the power of sin has been dealt with. We have the Holy Spirit. You sin because you want to. Amen, walls. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, what, am I, what needs to be said here, we still have a responsibility though. Even though he declared us righteous and holy in him, there's a responsibility that we have in the sanctification process. 
and it's done. There's three stages of conversion that comes in that I want to talk about for a moment. And I'm spending there. There's three the tenses for those who are taking notes and want to say, what are the uh, stages of sanctification, the, state, uh, the three stages of sanctification? It goes again. Past tense. That means, that ex and I'm going to talk about it. It's past tense as positional sanctification. Present tense is progressive sanctification, which we're talking about tonight. Future tense is perfect sanctification. And let me break those over and talk about them. The very first one we're going to talk about here is the present tense, our positional sanctification. And it says here, and now one of the things, this is here, before we go back there, I want you to go back and stay there for a moment. It says here, positional sanctification, this happens at the time a believer has been saved and justified. The moment you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you repent of your sin, and now you have been positionally sanctified. That word means set apart, declared holy in Christ. That's positionally. That is a done deal. If you are in Christ, you are already holy. This is a point that I really need to understand. And how do you know that? Look, here's the verse that shows us how. In, the, in the Romans 1, 5 and 1, it says here, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it say? This is the process of justification by faith alone. Will you accept, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You have positionally, what? Sanctified and justified by faith in Christ. Now you have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That is sanctification. That's the process. Now, that's positionally, it set, sets you apart. And the justification comes by as a one-time event. And you have been changed. The moment you accept, accept Jesus Christ, remember it said, this is the whole point of being born again, which Nicodemus said, said, how can a man be going, uh, be, uh, be born again? Can he enter the second time? As my Lord said, he's born of the water and of the spirit, right? And your wise, you'll see God. So how do you do that? So it lets us know that the moment you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and this is the whole point of realizing positional sanctification, it tells us in 2 uh, Corinthians 5, 17, not only we've been justified, but it shows you that we have been sanctified. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New, new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, new has come. In other words, the old you, Oh, you is dead. Amen. This is what he said. That's now. That's positionally. Positionally, we have been sanctified. Another verse I didn't have put it in there uh, is that saying that when we come to Christ, we are saved by grace through faith. Now of works lest anyone should boast. Right? How do you do that? We're saved by grace through faith. How do you do it? It is a gift of God. That when, when you accept Jesus Christ, he declared you sanctified and set apart for his use. Now, that's it. But now, that's what, that's what I wanted to say here. It's a complete work of Jesus Christ. That his death, burial, and resurrection has positionally, when you believe that, have sanctified you. Now, present tense, where we are today. You say, now, I have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. So that's when we have progressive sanctification. You're saved, but you're still struggling with sinful habits in your life, attitudes, heart things, things that you used to do that you, you have not do. So Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't do, I find myself doing. He said, oh, wretched man I am, who shall save me from this body of sin and death? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ who I serve with my what? My mind. He realized that sanctification process is needed in his life. Christ has taken some things in our life to sanctify us. So progress is the present tense being the sanctification, which, which is where we are as believers today. We live in that are in Christ. The motive, the motive for the, the motive for you to save, to live a saved life is through the Holy Spirit start work. So he said you have to yield yourself unto the Holy Spirit, uh, believer to, to uh, grow in Christ likeness. That's what it is here. Now, as I said, once you say the Holy Spirit is not gonna make you do something you don't want to do. Amen. Now, this is a point that we need to understand because some of we are working with the Holy Spirit. But look here, I want to tell you, show you where how it works and what Christ is doing for us. In Philippians 1 and 6, it helps us here. And I want you to mark this in your Bible because this is a truth that helped me in my growing Christ. He said, for, this is Paul speaking to the Philippian church, reminding them of what Christ had done. He said, and I am sure of this, that he began, he who began a good work in you 
will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, Christ sanctified you, set you apart, but he is sanctifying you. The sanctification price takes something there, and he will complete the work. Before you get here, before you go to heaven, Christ is he's doing a work. He's taking some things, and he's working them out in your life. That is what he's doing now. We are being sanctified. The sanctification process is working in us. And I hope I'm not going too fast with this here. The third point of here, the third tense is there, is future tense. The future tense is here. This is what we call perfect sanctification. Is This is what we'll look like when we get to heaven. And some people have called this the glorification process. We have not gotten there, but the verse that I want you to mark in your Bible to let you know what you got to look forward to, even in the midst of this sanctifying process, and sometimes God, and, and, and sometimes we hear bearing fruit, he said, he that firm fruit, he prunes it, which means that he's pruning us. He's taking some things out of our life that make us ready for Jesus Christ. Somebody need to say amen because we, you may be going through a pruning process right now and realize why you're dealing with the struggle that you have because Christ is trying to make you holy. But here's what we got to look forward to. First John 2 and 3. Definitely mark this in your Bible. And it says here, Beloved, we are the children of God now. Who are those that are in sanctified positionally? Those who are being sanctified, going through the sanctification process, God is taking things out of our life. Those who are looking for that future uh, uh, sanctification means glorification. He said, "Beloved, we are the children of God now, and what we shall, and what we have, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know when that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him in it." A future glorification, the whole process of sanctification is making us like Jesus Christ. One day, we will be totally sanctified, sanctified and we'll be glorified and be like Christ. This is what John is saying. So now that I've given you a brief definition of what the sanctification process, let me show you how it works in us. First, it is God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit that is working together to sanctify us. It's, it's the, the Trinity works in us your sanctifying process. God is doing something through Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life. Hebrews 2 and 11 says here, look what it says, For he who sanctifies, who, he who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Why? Because it is what God is doing. This is what here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is working in our lives in making us holy. This is what progressive sanctification process is. Remember, God the Father sanctified. He set us apart with Christ, right? Christ has given us his word, and the Holy Spirit is sanctifying, applying, allowing us to work out our own salvation. So the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. That's his job. He's the one that's working. Remember I said, he, Christ was to complete the work. We've already declared holy, but he's taken some things out of our life. And sometimes it's going to take work more than others. And all this work is of God and not us. Here's a verse that um, <laughs> I preach many times. Every time I go back, it, it just reminds me of how much I need Christ. And that is 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Look what he said. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as to be the first fruit to be saved through what, here it is, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. What? He's telling the saints here. God here has chosen us, chosen us to be the first fruit of those that are saved. He was saying to be saved. Talking to the Thessalonian church to be an example through what? Sanctification. How is it done? By the Holy Spirit and belief in the truth. What is the truth? God's Word. But it's not what... Our participation, you know, uh, without the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is very clear that we are called to be holy, which means set apart, is what God's called us to be, set apart, consecrated for God's use, and separated from sin. Known and unknown sin God wants us to deal with in the Old Testament and in the New. Here's an Old Testament verse that helps us understand this point here. In Leviticus 11.44. This is what the Lord telling the children of Israel. He says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be what? Holy. Why? For I am holy. You shall not defile yourself with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. 
First of all, he says, consecrate yourself. You notice, he didn't say he was going to do it, right? He's telling them, you consecrate yourself. That's why I said, it's the work. We need to work with the Holy Spirit to do this. And in the New Testament, look what he says in 1 Peter, talking about how this holiness and this man, you need to do it. This is well, I made holy. Yeah, no, you need to participate in this process. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, but, but as he called you is holy, you also be holy in, here it is what? All your conversation. Who's going to do the work? You got to do it. There are some things here. Yes, if God has saved you, now you got to do your part and allow the Holy Spirit to work out uh, your sanctification in you. He said, since it is written, you shall be holy. For why? I, I am holy. So I wanted to establish the point here is because there are those that think that, you know, it's all uh, God's work and not theirs. H and, uh, H and A, H A Ironside called holiness the false and the true. And I want to read this here, and I know I may get a few minutes over, but I, I when I read this, it, uh, Dr. High Vines uh, turned me on to this book here years ago because I was in the holiness church, and he really want me to understand, uh, you know, holiness and deal with how God wants us to live a holy life. And and H A Ironside, and you can still find this book, and it's called. Holiness, the false and the true, for those who are looking at it. Good book is good reading for us that are preachers, especially, and for those who are trying to live a life that's pleasing to God. But listen to what it says here. For the first six years of H. of Harry Ironside's Christian life, he was involved with a group that taught that sinless perfection could be obtained by the believer with the experience called the second blessing. Ironside believed that if he shoved hard enough, zealously resisted temptation, and used various methods taught him by the group, he would reach this state of perfection. Here's the part that got my attention. He said, during this time period, Ironside became aware that many who were on the same path to perfect holiness fell into despair and mental breakdown. And he himself finally became tormented that he had perhaps lost his salvation and was doomed to be eternally lost because he failed to reach this level of perfect holiness. He said, finally, young Ironside came to the realization that he had become wholly dependent upon himself rather than on Christ. Very important we understand this here. He saw that he was looking from within for holiness and not without. He thought it was something he did. And brothers and sisters, and I say this in those, and being a holiness preacher myself and growing up a holiness church, I've learned it's not me. Yes, do I live a holy life? I strive a bit, but it's the, what I live, I don't live by my own power. God is not going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Bishop Robert Wynn said something, and it stuck with me. We used to come out to my job, and he would, we would have devotions together, him and I, every week. And here's something that I, he said to me that stuck into me, and I wrote it down, and I tried to remind others of the same. He says here, Bishop Wynn says that every tub has to sit on his own bottom. In other words, God will, God will do what you can't do, but he will not do for you what you can do. Let me say that again. That needs to stick in our mind. It says here, every tub, every tub needs to sit on his bottom. In other words, you got your own responsibility. In other words, God will do what you do for you what you cannot do, but he will not do for you what you can do. So right into the church of Thessalonica, Paul gives a strong plea for the purity. It's not us, but the Holy Spirit. Here, let's see 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and 5. And this is here, uh, I know we all have preached this for a long time, but listen to what he says about holiness. He said, this is the will of God. What? The will of God is that you're what? Even your what? Sanctification. sanctification. And what is your sanctification? That you... Uh, see the outside. Sexual immorality and that you would abstain and, and that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And um, this, which is, which is very important that he said, uh, in possession, not... Not in the passion of the lust, like the Gentiles who know not God. Read this, it implies that believers play a part in the sanctification process. To help you see 
how this works, I want you to give you a few verses that I want you to write down and in your Bible, and I'm trying to conclude, conclude this. I may go a little over today for this because I want to finish this here. Romans 8 and 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live to the spirit, you ought to put the deeds, the death, the deeds of the body. Your responsibility in this process is to put the death, the things that you do in the flesh. Amen. Now, and, and the list can be wide along what we, each one of us need to do to put up in here. Galatians 5 uh, says here, when it tells us, Galatians, I'm going to read this from the, ES, the uh, English easy read version. He says here, the, the, wrong things, the, sim, the wrong things the sinful self does are clear. Committing sexual sins, being morally bad, doing all kinds of shameful things, worshiping false gods, taking part in witchcraft, hating people, causing trouble, being jealous, angry, or selfish, causing people to argue and divide into separate groups, being filled with envy, getting drunk, having wild parties, and doing other things like this. I warn you now, and I warn you before, the people who do such things will not be part of the kingdom of God. So, what he's saying, and, and I, I, I can go on and on, uh, but what he's telling us is to walk in the Spirit. Um, so, the verse that I think that should we all should be here, some of us think that, that let go, let God. No, it's not let go, let God. It's let go, let's go. Let God, let's go. So, in other words, let God do the work. In Philippians, he tells us that we're here. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of good pleasure. So, what is Paul saying here? Paul said, it is our responsibility to work out. To work out. And uh, our salvation. Which means, and in this period, is what we call the president imperative. Meaning, is a continuously obey this command. And as a command to do it with fear and truth, we ought to be reverence God so much. We're continuing. It is God that's working in us, right? Knowing that you can't do it in your own strength, you're dependent on the Holy Spirit to do the work in you. Our main problem, is, uh, and everyone, it's, it's said here, our main problem is we need to look in the mirror. The problem, the reason why we can't live a holy life, because we're trying to do it in our own power. Paul says in Philippians that this progressive and practical sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit. Once again, in verse 13, it says it, For it is God who what? works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we know if God is doing the work continuously, he's energizing and strengthening us to do his good pleasure. This is the most liberating truth. I had to write this to remind myself. I have learned that has helped me live in freedom of Terry Whitehurst, trying to do the things that please God. I cannot do it, but I have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. So if we want to continue to yield and surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit, He will control us and He will help us live a life of holiness. One of the things, here's that verse I want you to remember, rise. Once again, we'll go back to verses 12 and 13. Back one verse. And here, here's what I want you to remember. Uh, put this to memory and meditate on this. This is what the sanctification process is. It said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your what? Your own, own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you can memorize this verse, memorize it and uh, meditate on it and let God show you what the sanctification process is. I went five minutes over tonight uh, to help you realize we can be holy because Christ have already saved us and we have the Holy Spirit in us sanctifying us. All you need to do, and if you struggle in any area of your life, what you need to do is confess it, if you do it, and repent of it. So I leave this last second that Sister Whitehurst have anything that she want to ask at this point, and then we will close with a word of prayer. You, you just started off. Uh, once again, explain if one sins, whether knowingly or uh, through anger, etc., or unknowingly, what are the steps one should take to get back into fellowship with God? 
Well, uh, the scripture is explaining that first we need to confess. He says, we, we confess our sins, and then with confession means that you're agreeing with God what you did is wrong. Then what you do, you repent, you return from that sin. And if you confess that sin, you repent of it, then he said he would cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And now you're back in fellowship with God. So, but if you don't, if you're in sin and you don't repent of it, now, now even the saved person, you can be saved and out of fellowship with God. What is that? Out of the blessings of God. He that says that uh, he walk in uh, the light, but walk in darkness is a lie and the truth is not in him. So in other words, you cannot continue to live in sin and believe that you're in fellowship with God. I've, I've heard many people that say, I know they live in a sinful life. Lord, bless me. No, the devil can do some things and he can deceive you to thinking that you are in fellowship with God when you, whether it's shacking, whether you're committing fornication, whether you're lying, whether you uh, have an attitude with people, have an unforgiving spirit, you're out of fellowship with God. That is a sin. If that's what you're doing, you confess it, turn from it, and you'll be back in fellowship with God. And that's what sanctification process is. Remember, those he loves, he chasing. And if you're not, if you in, say you're in Christ and you're living in sin and not being chasing, he says you are a bastard, an illegitimate child. You're really not saved. So I hope that would help you and answer your question. Uh, you have more statements. Go right ahead. That's one more. How can you have peace with all men when people, you know, whether they do it purposely or whatever, do mean things to hurt you? Well. Because what you do, actually, and that's why you tell us that uh, we are to, um, to, with all possible, live at peace with all men. On your part, you have to forgive them. And once you forgive them, and you turn that situation over to God, you don't hold it again. And then, so now, because what happens is, now, you have dealt with it. You have forgiven them. Now, you can't change a person. You can't make them right. Only thing you can get right is yourself. Now, and they if you don't go, you ain't got to go to their face and try to make them say, well, forgive me. If they don't want to forgive you, that's on them. But you have been free because you have done what Christ has uh, asked you to do. And once you do that, you can live in freedom. You know, there's many times in people's life, you know, I maybe harm people and people have harmed me. And they didn't want to get right with me, but I, I had to forgive them. But you know what? I sleep good at night. See, I, I learned the scripture that says that he neither sleep nor slumber. So if God is not sleeping... And he's taking care of it. I might as well go to sleep because God have already handled it. So God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. I hope this helps someone tonight. And, um, and from week to week, we're trying something new with Sister Whiters and myself. That um, if she thinks of something that maybe somebody would ask, or, then she would bring it out and point. Because I cover so much area, it's hard for some time to get it all in. And so continue to pray for us that we can continue to bring you the word of God. This is my point to trying to disciple those who I don't even see. Because Christ tells us we are to make disciples, not viewers, not church members, but make disciples. And if I can do anything, I can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God. So God bless you and God keep you as our prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for this time that we had in your Word, Father. We thank you, Father, that we have, we have heard and learned more about sanctification and how you declare it as holy. And that how, Father, you are sanctified, making us holy through the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, we're going to say, Lord, we have not all done what we should have done. But we ask you tonight, forgive us, Father, for not yielding ourselves to the power of your Holy Spirit. And sometimes we know we have grieved you. And sometimes, Father, we have actually just turned our back. But today, Lord, we're asking you, fill us today, Father. Control us so that we will walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So until Christ come again, God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I mean, I went a few minutes over. It's um, actually almost 10 minutes over. So share us and continue to like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Because, like I said, we can share the gospel. If you never go on knocking on the door, it's a new day. New method. The gospel has not changed. The message is still. Salvation is by grace through faith. Right? But you can tell it now by just clicking a button. So, remember, we have an in-service uh, um in-person services at Good News Church there at 239 West Washington Place. And we are using uh, CDC rules, a face masks, we're still singing. And uh, God is blessing us. So if you want a place to worship, we'll see you from 830 to 945 each Sunday morning. Have a blessed evening.